Chapter 2, The Sting If all of this sounds a bit James Bond, then it's probably because it was, although it turned out being more like Mr Bean when we'll be getting ready to go to see Afzal and his people. Was I scared? Not really. My life would undoubtedly be a lot calmer if I did not get scared more easily. I'm only five foot six tall. I hardly scare people to death with my intimidating physique. I'm not sure if that leads to people thinking they can push me around, but these situations usually end up in blood and tears for someone. I have also been around the houses enough times to know that this bloke, Naheem, fancied himself as something of a gangster. He was making sure he sent me that message, loud and clear. Just how close that was to the truth, I discovered when we sat down at the restaurant he owns in Broad Street in the centre of Birmingham. Mick went out and bought £3,500 worth of surveillance gear, and on the Monday of that meeting we set off, calling to pick up Steve Eddowes in Wolverhampton. When we got to Edda's place, the room was full of the EDL leadership blokes I hadn't seen in a long time. I think some of them thought, hoped even, that I was coming back to the organisation, but I put them right about that. It wasn't even up for debate. However, I had to explain everything that was going on about AFSAL to them and insist the information didn't leave these four walls. This wasn't something that could be made public, otherwise I was in serious trouble. One of the lads said, I thought you'd given up the fight. I replied, no, I'm just looking for a different way to fight. These blokes are still all good men. They know when to keep their mouth shut. Mike had booked a hotel room near Birmingham Airport to get me wired up, but it was miles for the meeting, and we were already late. I called Afsal and bought some time, saying Adders had been held up. We had one device on my watch, and Mike had bought a, cam had bought a camera that was built into a pair of glasses. Great, eh? Except I don't wear glasses. I'd look a right tit showing up in a pair of specs. There was one recording gizmo on my key ring, a white USB stick that was a listening device, then one that was in a camera and a microphone in a phone case. Talk about overkill. All of this was straightforward enough, but the main camera was going to be in my jumper, which I'd left with Mike that morning to get it ready. That's where the trouble started, because the power pack for this thing was about twice as big as a cigarette packet and needed to be strapped round my podgy belly. I thought wonderful, absolutely effing wonderful. I looked like I was wearing a colostomy bag. It's customary with Asians to greet one another with a hug, but these guys would put their arms around me and grab a handful of listening equipment between my shoulder blades, and that wasn't all. We were in a rush. Mike was trying to get the thing sorted. I ended up with gaffer tape wrapped around me like a corset, which had the effect of showing all my fat belly down and out. I looked like a boozy dart player, with a tub of lard poking over my belt. If you can get something good out of bad, it was that I'd been in a car accident a few days before. So, when we got to the restaurant, I explained that I had whiplash and just shook my hands. It was a wonder I was there at all. I pulled out of the road and got hit sideways by a lorry. The car was written off, but I climbed out unmarked, without a mark on me. The policewoman who came to attend the accident said hello and told me she'd once sat outside my house for a whole week. Small world. Apparently that was after one of the death threats we got which resulted in a Muslim bloke chasing my cousin Kevin Carroll down his road trying to get in range to use his shotgun. Kev broke his toe, hurdling over the fences making his escape. We laughed our asses off at that although it might not have been so funny if the bloke had actually caught him. Anyway, back to the restaurant, and having avoided the hugs, I then had to try and sit down. Bugger me. I almost went pop. We put these things on with me standing up. When I sat down in the restaurant, the pop belly suddenly looked like I was giving birth. Naeem took one look at my gut, laughed and said, Fucking hell, Tommy. It's a wonder. I didn't lose my bottle of scarper. That seemed an even better idea, given what happened when, when Nadine's brother, Bibi, came in. There are four brothers in the family firm, but this character, Bibi, 
clearly founded himself as the hard man, gold tooth to a whole gangster approach, when he walked in and got introduced. Naeem said to me, Know what my brother said, Tommy? He said, Get him shot, he's a wanker. They told us they had the building surrounded by their boys. It was straight out of Godfellas, or Godfather. Edders told them, And you don't think we haven't got our lads all around this place, looking out for us? Naeem said he'd spoken to the Luton Muslim blokes, gangsters, blokes like Nigel Khan, who's notorious around the place. He said that they got the inside track on me, that I was the bloke they thought I was, whatever that was supposed to mean. The loud and clear message was that they were hard cases and it wouldn't be a good idea to cross them. None of us are stupid, right, Tommy? said this BB bloke. I chuckled, which you could hear on the tape. Yes, you are, pal, I was thinking. So there I was, Rongans, on the left and the right of me, a wanker to the front, Afzal, and the whole place was surrounded by blokes who wouldn't think twice about killing us. Shit, these were people whose spiritual leaders had put them on order to execute me at any cost, the first chance they got. There was also a Sikh man present who was a captain in the army. It seemed to me as though Afzal was using him to get the Sikh vote, but I don't think he was involved in anything underhand. He was just there for show. I didn't particularly want him there, if I'm honest, because as far as I was aware, he'd done nothing wrong. I've always got along with, with the Sikhs. I have a lot of respect for them. It all got a bit embarrassing then when Bibi started on him. I sort of guessed the bloke was probably gay, but Bibi started busting his chops, asking him if he was married, if he had kids, all that stuff. Bibi knocked my leg under the table and winked. I just thought, so what, arsehole? We got down to business, and Afsal and Naeem came out with all of it. What they wanted were the EDL, with Edders and the boys, calling a follow-up demo which they'd cancel and credit Afsal for. He talked about this evening with Tommy Robinson event, although it would have to go under the name of some made-up community group, not the Tories. I could say what I normally would, but finish with vote for the army guy. He's fought for us in Iraq and Afghan. He'll fight for us now. I was careful not to lead anyone into saying something, by the way. But I needn't have worried. These blokes were so full of themselves. Naeem was talking about Assal when he was the MP, being able to intervene with the chief of police when they had any business problems, going on about him being their bloke in Parliament. Assal even bragged about him and Naeem being at the meeting the week before with David Cameron. He said that people were milling around the Prime Minister, but that he told Naeem, we're not going over there, just wait, he'll come to us. And sure enough, David Cameron pushed past these people and made a beeline to Afsal, shaking his hand and asking him how the campaign was doing. Afsal talked about Conservative HQ, asking him which committees he wanted to go on when he got elected. He even said he wanted to be Prime Minister. I'm not going into politics just to be another MP, Tommy, he said. I'm ambitious. I want to go places. I want the top job. It was unbelievable. Honestly, it was. He said that after a year or so in Parliament, he'd tell Cameron the EDL were right all along, that one bloke was speaking the truth about the Muslim problem, Tommy Robinson. Did I believe it? What do you think? I can tell the difference between a drop of sweat and someone pissing down the back of my leg. He would use me, use the EDL, and when he got where he wanted, by hook or by crook, he'd dump on us from the top of Big Ben. There was nothing more certain. And what if me or Edda spoke up? Who would the media believe, do you think? And even if we did blow the stunt later, how would that reflect on us, that we'd been happy to get involved in such shenanigans? There'd be a queue of people from all quarters wanting to string me and Edda's up. And of course... There were also the big bad brothers, Naeem, Bibi and company. They'd made a song and a dance about their close friend with Tony, who'd been shot coming out of the gym. The geezer was a notorious gangster who had survived one shot because he was wearing a bulletproof vest, but not the next one. It was all for show, to impress us with how bad they were. We finished the meeting about 11pm 
and dropped Mick back at the hotel. I took Steve Eddowes home, befriended the Yaleel boys, who had waited around about what was going on, pressed home the point that it all had to stay absolutely under wraps. Then it was back to the hotel and a drive home. The motor was shut up and it was 4.30am when we got back to Luton.